And I said, well, on the 2nd of March 2011, I woke up with two beautiful sons. I went to sleep that night with one, all because of a simple defibrillator. The doctor says, look, Mrs. Lamian, we've tried all we can. We need to stop because the more we're doing this, it's not helping. We are really, we're actually punishing him. I just no. think she never even thought about it. and Because you do never think about it, because you take everything yeah. for granted. What we're getting much better at is understanding the true prevalence of these conditions and how many people are dying suddenly. You would never forgive yourself if your child collapses in the sports field um, and you discover that they have that heart condition and it was completely preventable if you had carried out a screening. to be in some distress as well for Brees Muamba. Physio keen to turn him on his side. Well, I have to say this looks increasingly serious. And one or two of the Bolton players turning away in some distress. I think Owen Coyle is coming to see for himself and when he gets there, it's not a particularly good sight awaiting him. But there have been efforts, it would seem, from our vantage point to try to resuscitate Fabrice Muamba. Just over a year ago, the world stopped and watched as footballer Fabrice Muamba collapsed after a cardiac arrest in front of over 36,000 unsuspecting fans. His heart stopped beating for 78 minutes. Muamba made a miraculous recovery, but the nation was suddenly aware of a silent killer that creeps up unannounced, claiming its victims without warning. Sudden death syndrome kills 12 young people every week, and one year on from Fabrice's trauma, nothing has been done to reduce this figure. With the number of sudden deaths at an all-time high, why is awareness at an all-time low? Two months ago, I read an article about a 16-year-old boy, Philip Larman, a pupil at this school, Bexley Heath Academy, who died suddenly playing football with his friends. I've come here today to talk to his head teacher, his mum and his friends. A rising football star and dedicated Arsenal fan, Philip's school have built a garden in his memory. I met with four of his best friends who reminisce about their times together and the impact Philip's death has had. Yeah, when all the girls around, he's had the special walk he used to do. We used to come to school. Come to school, yeah, from anything. Yeah, like he put it on straight away. Yeah, he's put in on his special walk all the time. I actually remember that morning. That morning, we got the same bus in the morning, like, he was just there and then to not be with somebody the following the rest of the yeah, day. Yeah, the no, first no. day was really, really hard. When we came into assembly, and then they had like picture, like a shrine. Yeah. It was yeah. very I, I, emotional. I didn't expect the picture. So yes, as, it as was. Like, when I came to assembly, I thought, okay, maybe I won't cry. Maybe, maybe I'll be fine. Yeah. It, that's what there. I when thought. I saw yeah. the picture. It just, that, that was it. That's yeah. when everyone was just crying. Yeah. Everyone was just coming to us. Yeah. The school, so, like, the atmosphere just... Exactly. Yeah. We, we were all... And I mean, in terms, yeah. in terms of us yeah. as friends, I mean, we've got a lot, a lot more closer. Yeah, and there's much, been new much. people that have been involved into our very into much. our little group as well. Yeah. So we've got a lot closer since since we've like with Philip. Family, you know. It's like he's brought us together. Yeah. If you could say one thing to Philip now, what would you say? Is it too much there? Is there anything, a final thing uh, you want to share? I, I don't think I could actually say one thing. Yeah. I mean, if I saw him again, we'd have to have a Our chat for, for mm. more than hours, yeah, it, it would be so long. I mean, so much has happened since, since he's passed, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. there'd be a lot to catch up on. Philip's mother, Juliet, took me to visit a memorial wall painted by two boys in Philip's year. Still coming to terms with her son's sudden death, she sits down to tell me what happened that day. From the beginning, um... <sighs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. On the 5th of February, um, I was at home, I think about 4 o'clock, and got a phone call from Philip Best Friend, one of Philip Best Friend, called me again, and, um, and said, oh, you need to come to school because um, Philip was playing, we were playing football, and Philip scored a goal and fell off, so they thought he was joking, one of his jokes, you know. But then, when he didn't get up, they decided to go and take him and put his head on the pillow and it was trashing. And at first I didn't take it serious because he's been playing football since he was two. So he always fall down, always get phone call that he's playing football on his phone. But this time around, the phone call was very different because his friend was crying. And I asked him, is he breathing? Is he, he wasn't sure, he said he was breathing. 
and I said, okay, I'll make my way straight to the school. So I was on my way to school when um, one of the teachers said, okay, you need to go straight to Queen Elizabeth Hospital because they didn't have enough e equipment to treat him here, so they've taken him to the hospital. So then I began to panic. So got to the hospital, and there was my son lying down. And there were all, about seven doctors were on him doing whatever they were doing, and they asked me to come in. I was scared to go in, you know, because at that time I was expecting him to be okay. From the time they called me to the time I went to the hospital, at least he should be breathing. But when they said he was until that time, and I said, okay, this is serious. The doctor said, look, Mrs. Lamian, we've tried all we can. We need to stop because the more we're doing this, it's not helping. We are really, we're actually punishing him because they were all pressing on him and blood was coming out. I said, please continue, don't stop. And they were going on and going on. And I went out again. And after an hour, they came back. They said, look, we really need to stop. So they stopped. I also met with Carl Wakefield, Philip's head teacher. Yeah, the day we lost Philip was a very difficult day indeed. Um, it did come as a huge shock. It obviously, like with these things, out of the blue. I was in a meeting at the time. Uh, called out the meeting to say that there'd be there was an emergency just down our offsite facility, um, and and the word they're doing CPR on him. It just didn't sink in. And then when I got to the scene and I saw all the students in tears and then I saw my staff just looking totally sheepish and looking at me as if to say help it was a case of then I realized what was happening he was very well liked he was charismatic you couldn't call him Phil it was Philip he clocked just over 11 seconds for 100 very talented footballer School, do you have any plans to implement a screening program or anything well the responsibility is mine I've got a first aid meeting coming up the first week back after the uh, half term break with professionals around the table. We'll utilise a defibrillator that's been bought for us. We'll go through a screening programme and we're also going to involve um, all the other local secondary schools as well to open it up to them. So We've come to St George's Hospital in Tooting where they're holding a cardiac screening today. They expect about 100 people to turn up, all of whom will receive an ECG for free. An ECG stands for an electrocardiogram and involves 10 electrodes attached to the body. These transmit electrical signals from the heart to a machine. An ECG can detect problems with the heart's rhythm. Sometimes an ECG can also indicate if the heart is enlarged or thickened. Dr Stephen Cox is the head of screening at the charity CRY and is leading today's free screening clinic. He tells me why the screening process is vital to help prevent young people having a sudden cardiac arrest. One in 300 people will have a potentially life-threatening condition that we screen. So today there's a chance there'll be someone who identified with a very serious condition. One in 100 people will have a, a less serious condition, but one which could cause a problem later on in their life. Now, up until probably about two years ago, one year ago, the vast majority of people who came through for cardiac screening actually knew of someone who had died suddenly within their local community. When they know someone who's died who had no symptoms, they suddenly feel at risk. And this is exactly why 18-year-old Ben is here today. He is a squash player who trains with the British under-19 squad. And this February, one of his teammates, Harry, died of a cardiac arrest during a league match, aged just 18. This personal tragedy has prompted him and the rest of the team to undergo cardiac screening. Today, Ben has already had an ECG and is now having an echo, which is a cardiac ultrasound of his heart. By taking moving images of the heart, doctors can take a look at the size and structure and see if there are any abnormalities. The doctors were able to tell Ben there and then that his results were normal, meaning that he can continue to play sport at the top level without worry. We know that sport will increase the risk of sudden death by threefold if you have an underlying condition. So we're not saying that sport causes these problems, but we are saying if you engage in sport, it's important to know about them. In Italy, where screening is mandated in sport, they've reduced the incidence of sudden death by 89%. It's not just professional sports players who are at risk. Young, active children are among the 12 people that die from sudden death syndrome each week. Storm is 11 and was diagnosed with a heart condition when he was very young. He has atrial ventricular septal defect. We found out when Storm was a very young baby, um, approximately three months old, and I have a history of heart conditions in my family. So we had the screen done and we discovered that he had ASD 
Well, it means he can lead a, a perfectly normal life, but it does require him to not overexert himself. So, for example, he can engage in any sporting activity that he wishes, um, but he mustn't overexert himself because that could lead to problems. Um, I would definitely recommend that other parents would get their children screened. You would never forgive yourself if your child collapses in the sports field um, and you discover that they have that heart condition and it was completely preventable if you had carried out a screening. Because you won't know what you're dealing with. Um, you can't tell and it's better to know than not to know. And the only way you can do that is by screening. What we've seen slightly differently since the collapse of Fabrice Mwamba and the sudden death of Claire Squires is a much higher demand. So for the first time since we've started, we're actually playing catch up a little bit and developing, expanding our services quickly to be able to respond to that re the requirement, the, the demand from people to be tested. It changed it changed the goalposts a little bit where suddenly the general population realised these events really do occur. Um, for many people when they see the articles in the newspaper they will skip over them. They will be there at the sudden death but for parents to, to read an article about a, a 14 year old or a 20 year old child dying is almost too painful and they'll move over it very quickly and that's one of the challenges in raising awareness is balancing the message. So just how high is awareness about sudden death syndrome amongst young people? Lucy and Sarah, both university students, told us how much they knew. Very little. I feel as though I should know more than I do because I know it's like a growing issue and you kind of hear things cropping up in the news all the time about really young people just dying. Um, but I, I really don't know that much about it. Yeah, I, I don't know really. I'm not really aware of it at all. And to be honest, I think I never really thought that it was a big issue. I just don't hear about it that often. Mm. Are you aware that up to 12 young people between the ages of 14 and 35 die every week from sudden death syndrome? That's really shocking. That's so high. So high. And I guess, I mean, because we're like, because we're, well, you're 19 and I'm 20, but still, even from 14 to 35, I mean, you just think that that's far too that young. That age bracket is just really shocking. Mm. Would you ever imagine this to happen to one of your friends at university? I just no. never, she never even thought about it. Because you do never think about it because you take everything yeah. for granted and then when something tragic happens, you... I don't know. When it's not happened to them, they believe these events don't occur. Often when they do occur, they might be misattributed to something else. We see this quite a lot, sometimes drowning, sometimes epilepsy. And very tragically for families, when you have rumour campaigns about drugs, whereas we know that drugs, just like sport, can trigger an event, not necessarily cause the problem. So even if you do know about sudden death syndrome, how easy is it to take steps to protect yourself? Well, I'm going to give my GP a call to see if I can get an appointment for an ECG. Hello, sorry to keep you. How may I help? Oh, hi there. I was hoping to book an appointment for an electrocardiogram. What's one of those? An ECG. Okay, so you need to see a doctor to be referred, yeah? So do you not do the ECG at the, at the doctor's? No, you'd have to go to the hospital to have that. Is that standard practice? Yeah, far as I'm aware, yeah. So today's my doctor's appointment and I've been told that I need a referral to get an ECG in a hospital. So I'm going to go into my GP now and get one. So, interesting news, I've just been told by my doctor that I can't get an ECG and she refused point blank to refer me to a hospital to get one. Now she said this was because I didn't have any chest pains or a genetic history of heart conditions in my family. But from the articles I've been reading in the papers, these young people dying every week hardly ever show signs of chest pains and even more rarely have genetic heart conditions in their families. So it does seem a bit shocking to me, but even if I did want to take measures to protect myself, it seems very, very tricky. Therefore, the only way to get checked out is to sign up for a screening clinic, which is exactly what Alex has done today, just to gain some peace of mind. And the results of the ECG are then printed out on graph paper and passed on to a doctor who then analyses whether further tests need to be taken out. We, we need to produce the evidence to the government that shows that national screening should be done. We're building an infrastructure of cardiac doctors, specialists, who can actually provide these services. It's one thing to actually screen at the front end to, uh, to test someone with an ECG or an echo. 
But actually that's, um, that's just the start of the process. You need the infrastructure in the NHS to manage people when they're identified. We, we want to see our program, instead of supporting families after a bereavement, for those tragic deaths to be minimized. So what we're getting much better at is understanding the true prevalence of these conditions and how many people are dying suddenly. It's all very well having screenings in hospitals, but people sometimes have to travel miles to attend. With 12 young people dying each week, shouldn't we be targeting the masses, screening young people in schools and universities? We travelled up the M1 to speak to a school who are one step ahead of the game. So we're on our way to Nottingham and we're going to go to Nottingham High School for Boys. Um, there we're going to speak to Martin Smith who's the head of PE. Martin and the school's medical department are taking the reins to prevent tragedy striking yet again at their school. In 2008 they lost a former student to a sudden cardiac arrest and have since held a screening that was available to all students aged 14 and over. It was all prompted by, by an unfortunate death of, a, of an old boy who died. I think he was probably around 26. It was very, very sudden. He'd been an active member of the, the, the school, so, um, representing the school at rugby and cricket. Uh, I, I spoke at his funeral. Uh, so that gave us, gave us the idea of doing the screening. We weren't aware that, that such a thing could happen at the time. Uh, and it was a very successful event. When, uh, unfortunately, the footballer Muamba uh, had a problem a couple of years ago, um, the general public were made aware of uh, a sudden cardiac uh, arrest. Um, fortunately, he, he survived. Unfortunately, too many uh, young people don't. I'd like to see other schools getting involved as well. Uh, I, I do hope that it doesn't take the death of one of their pupils to, to actually prompt them to, 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 to do any screening and fundraising. But in schools, um, I think we could all do far more. Um, and £35 per parent does sound a lot, um, but if it saves a death, uh, I think it's money well spent. So what do you think we should be doing to raise awareness about sudden death syndrome? As a country, as a society, we do need to raise awareness of sudden death syndrome. Uh, and, and the way to do that is, is to promote the work of CRY, um, to, to have screening events. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have two uh, defib machines within the school, one on the school site and one at the playing fields. Uh, but access to them um, more widely in public places. Defibrillators. This is the other side of the coin, the other potential lifesaver that could dramatically reduce the number of deaths from sudden cardiac arrest. At the moment, you'd be pushed to find a defibrillator in many public places. Only 50% of ambulances and 1% of police vehicles carry them. But statistics show that more than 75,000 lives per year in the UK could be saved by the immediate availability of a defibrillator for a person in cardiac arrest. And early defibrillation can increase the chance of survival from 5% to more than 50%. The Oliver King Foundation are campaigning for defibrillators to be more widely available. After several thwarted attempts to bring the matter to Parliament, they have finally had a breakthrough. It's just gone three o'clock, which means that there are two hours left until the Oliver King Foundation meet with Public Health Minister Anna Subri to discuss their proposals to implement defibrillators nationwide. Parliament previously not having given them the time of day, they hope that bringing their petition with over 160,000 signatures will lead their case to be taken more seriously. So today we're meeting with Anna Subri, who's the Public Health Minister, and we've had quite a challenge actually, first of all, meeting Anna or getting to a dis stage because we wrote to the Prime Minister's office and he told us that we needed to speak to Anna Sue because it's the Department for Health matter. The Department for Health have been categorically clear that it's got nothing to do with them and defibrillators are responsibility for the ambulance service. The public in Liverpool know that defibrillators are in every school in the city. We don't know that in any other city. I could be in Manchester have a collapse outside the primary school. I don't know if they've got a defibrillator or not. The person I'm with doesn't know that either. This needs to be legislation which brings alongside that education. We need legislation. We have to get this done. It's, you know, legislation is the be all and end all of this campaign. There is no point us putting defibrillators here, there and everywhere because if I collapse right here, you're not going to know where to go and get a defibrillator from. So if there's legislation, you're going to know. Like the smoke ban, you know, you can't smoke in a building, you can't smoke in public building for example so you would like to know that there'll be a defibrillator in there as well. Outside the Department of Health I spoke to Mark King, Oliver's dad. We launched the campaign um, 
January 2012 at the King David campus in Liverpool. We had three main aims, that was to bring awareness, uh, that was to make sure that there was a defibrillator placed in every public building by 2017. And the third one was to make sure that when the kids reach 14 years of age, they get a letter off the doctor to come and have a 12 pad ECG. What provoked the campaign was the loss of my son Oliver to SADS. Uh, Oliver passed away on the 2nd of March 2011 while he was having a swimming lesson in the King David campus in Liverpool. Oliver was uh, a fit and talented sportsman with an uncompromising zest for life. Um, the morning started off like a normal day. Oliver would set his alarm at 7 o'clock and go and wake his, brother, his younger brother Benno and he'd come into our room where the family snuggled till half seven and then it was pandemonium up, getting ready for school, running late as usual, pack lunches made, sports kits out, football boots polished and out. Um, and away we went to school. Um, obviously I remember it as though it was yesterday. But they worked on him for two hours in the hospital. Um, I couldn't get him back. I mean, at one point I had to apologise to the doctor because I had him by the tie over Oliver. Um, I told him to get him back to me. He said he wasn't God, I said he was today to get my son back. Uh, it wasn't to be, and I had to apologise to him outside. And as I say, since then, we won't give up. And even if I assume he still says no today, it's not the end of the foundation. We just carry on, we carry on, we put them to shame. So do you think if there had been a defibrillator at Oliver's school, it could all have been a very most, different story? Most definitely. Oliver would be here with me today, just like Fabrice Mwamba. Mm -hmm. But why should the elite have access to them? I mean. You know, we've, we've recently found out that the, the House of Commons have took 16 in since we've been and spoke to them. So they've got 16 defibrillators in there. OK, there's a lot of public coming in and out of there, but there's a lot of MPs in there, so they're OK. But leave our kids at grassroots level football. But what power does Anna Subri have that could take this forward? She can make it legislation. Mm. She can push for it and, and, and back it to, to be legislation. That's all we're asking. We're not asking the government for any money. In 12 months, three children are being saved. So imagine this being implemented 10 years ago, how many kids could we have saved? And that's what it's all about. On the 2nd of March 2011, I woke up with two beautiful sons. I went to sleep that night with one, all because of a simple defibrillator. This is Tom, and he owes his life to a defibrillator. When he suffered a cardiac arrest in 2010, he was fortunate enough that the ambulance that arrived at his flat was equipped with one. Without it, he would not have survived. Three years ago I had a cardiac arrest. I was 29 uh, and uh, yeah, my heart stopped beating for 25 minutes. The paramedic and the ambulance came with shocks and they immediately started to shock me and do the CPR. And they shot me in total six times and on the sixth shock I came around, um, which means that I'm, I didn't have a regular pulse um, until the sixth shock. And then the, the defibrillator uh, reset the heart rhythm, and I was my heart was beating on itself by itself again. You want to see defibrillators be more? Um, the yeah, effort. more defibrillators that are uh, distributed around uh, helps without a doubt. Specifically with my cardiac arrest, it was I had to have a defibrillator. The heart went into what's called ventricular tachycardia which meant that when the heartbeat usually goes like that, it's, and there's a Q and an S, and, and, and there's intervals between, it, it started going like that. And it's like a computer. You can reset the heart by shocking it. So I had to have a defibrillator, and people who have cardiac arrests that are shockable rhythms will need to have a defibrillator to shock and, and get their heart back into sync. What do you make of the fact that the House of Commons have brought in 16 defibrillators for themselves but are still hesitant to implement them in schools? Well, they obviously know it's important, um, but there's bureaucracy and legislation holding everything up, so that's no excuse. Um, it, needs to, it needs to be pushed through. Yesterday afternoon, Mark King had his meeting with Public Health Minister Anna Subri. We don't know how it went, so we're going to give him a call now to find out. So how did the meeting go, Mark? Um, it was very, very positive. Um, um, she, she put the cat amongst the pigeons as soon as we walked into the meeting by saying that um, she fully agrees and fully endorses what we're trying to do. Um, so good news then, Mark. 
absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the best news we could have hoped for, I mean, we went in there, we were travelling down thinking it, it was going to be a no again and we had to come out of there with something. And to be fair, I think we have come out of there with something from it. So how far away are we from legislation? Um, I'd like to think we're roughly about 12 months away. There's still a little bit of work to do and a, and a little, maybe not persuasion, but there's, there's still a bit, a bit to do and to, to get her fully on board with us. But I think when she comes to Liverpool and sees the enormity of what's happening across this city, you know, that, that she'll come fully on board. That's great news, Mark. Thanks so much for speaking to us. Thanks. Bye. With progress finally being made in terms of implementing a wider availability of defibrillators, I contacted the Department of Health with regards to introducing a national cardiac screening program. They replied and after a long list of reasons why they have no plans to implement such a program. They did say that the UK National Screening Committee is due to review its position on screening for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the most common cause of sudden death in those under 35. During the making of this film, progress has been made. Public Health Minister Anna Soubry will be visiting Liverpool in the first steps to make defibrillators in public places legislation. But awareness continues to be low. How long will it take for the screening of young people to be common practice, just like it is to get your BCG at school? And how many more Phillips, how many more Olivers, how many more people like you or your relatives must die before the government prioritise a national screening programme?